Say hello to a new friend on an old road. Take a two-lane trip of memories into mysteries unknown. Come along for the ride. Jim Hinckley's America. Jim Hinckley's America. Good morning, everyone. Starting our day off with a little bit of road trip inspiration from uh, Joe and Woody and the boys of the road crew at Road Crew 66. A little touch of winter here in Kangman. We have uh, even a chance of snow come Tuesday. That's the way we go. We've had a pretty mild fall, but when it makes the change here in Kangman, it usually does it fast. A week ago, Sunday, my boy and family, was we were sitting outside having a barbecue at about 70-some degrees, and and uh, now here we go. Hey, Mr. Finnessy, you just the man I need to hear from. We, we are due for a conversation, sir. I've got an idea. Of course, that doesn't surprise anybody, now does it, that i got an idea. Andy, how are you? How are things in Kentucky? Well, let's see. We, we got a little something different for you today. But So let's get this show on the road. And we're going to talk electric vehicles, the future of Route 66. And, uh, well, let's see. And then we'll get to your questions and answers. I'll update you on the podcast. Uh, got some things I want to share with you on that, but we'll do that after I uh, after we get done with the program, depending on how much time we have. I sure don't want to beat my gums a whole bunch here. And, uh, well, we'll go from there. We're going to talk about Route 66, its future, crossroads of the past and future, legendary Route 66. Nice little picture there of the Aubrey Valley, uh, east of Seligman, or excuse me, west of Seligman, Arizona. Today's program is brought to you in part by the road trip experts at Route Trip USA. If you're looking for a holiday, uh, Canada or the United States, these are the, fact, the folks to give a holler. Uh, like me, they sample the enchiladas, they test the pillows, and well, they know all the folks to make sure that your trip is going to be memorable for the good reasons, and it's going to be interesting and entertaining. We start out with the bicycle. <coughs> The bicycle is the cornerstone. You know, we, we've, I've talked a lot about this, but uh, when Thomas Stevens set out on his big uh, penny farthing, that's the bicycle with a high front wheel, small back wheel, and wrote a book about his exploits from 84 through 1886, traveling around the world on a bicycle, sparked a mania. And the bicycle, of course, gave way to, in the 1890s, bicycle clubs that gave ro rise to basically what became the Good Roads Movement. But here's one for you. All the rage today, uh, one of the, we talk about and hear about a lot, electric assist bicycles. Well, nothing new under the sun. Hosea Libby introduced an electric bicycle in 1897. The bicycle uh, gave rise to the auto industry. A lot of people don't realize that the bicycle, its popularity, its mania, actually, internationally, this is where a lot of the great automotive pioneers got their start. One example is Mr. Louis Chevrolet. He apprenticed in a bicycle repair shop, was an avid bicycle racer, uh, and he established a small bicycle manufacturing business under the name Frontenac. Now, for automobile enthusiasts, you'll remember that fast forward about 25, 30 years, Mr. Lewis Chevrolet uh, started developing high-performance equipment for Model Ts and other vehicles under the Frontenac name. And, uh, like I say, it, it's a, it launched an entire industry. Orville and Wilbur Wright, they started with bicycles. Charles and Frank Duryea, uh, they had bicycles, and they were the first uh, company in the United States to begin manufacturing automobiles for sale, even though it was an anemic situation. We had the first auto race at uh, in 1895. 
And uh, Henry Ford built his first automobile, kind of a test vehicle, the legendary quadricycle in 1896. Also in 1896, Barnum and Bailey. Nobody knew what to do with the uh, automobile. Montgomery Ward said it was a fad you should take the children to see before it passes. Barnum and Bailey Circus gave the Duryea motor wagon top billing over the albino, the fat man, and the bearded lady. Winton, uh, Henry Ford launched his Detroit Automobile Company, first of three automobile companies. Mr. Olds, he tried as early as 1892 to explain why uh, an automobile would be better than a horse. He started out with steam engines, but uh, quickly gave way to uh, gasoline power. He even tinkered with electric vehicles a little bit. Here's just one example of, of the industry. Pulp Manufacturing Company. Albert Pulp uh, started out, like a lot of these companies, Pierce Arrow started out making bird cages, ice boxes, and all kinds of things like that. Uh, Albert Pulp started out producing household products, and then he uh, designed a bicycle, had a sewing machine company manufactured, and he distributed it through his various Pulp Manufacturing Company distributors. And then he started creating a General Motors type combine with bicycles. He bought out 45 of the leading bicycle manufacturers and established the American Bicycle Company. But in 1899, this man was a, he saw the future and he became a partner in the electric vehicle company, began manufacturing electric cabs for use in New York City. And then, of course, in 1904, he started uh, doing what he did with bicycles creating a uh, General Motors-type combine. Uh, you have the Selden patent in 1879, and I mentioned the Duryea brothers. Uh, there's a little poster from the Barnum & Bailey Circus, Haynes Apperson. But here's what's important in this timeline. Studebaker. A lot of people may remember Studebaker. They've been around for a long time. Uh, in fact, they started in the 1850s. And by the uh, 1870s, they were one of the largest manufacturers of wheeled vehicles in the world. When they first started their automobiles, though, they started out with an electric vehicle. By the way, there is a 1902 Studebaker Electric uh, at the Gold King Mine Auto Display over in Jerome, Arizona. Kind of an interesting little vehicle. To give you an idea, though, uh, electric vehicles, this is kind of an overlooked chapter until quite recently with Tesla and some of the other, Rivian and some of the other electric companies coming up, uh, people are rediscovering the, the heritage of electric vehicles. Uh, first electric taxis began operation in New York City. 28% of the automobiles produced in 1900 were electric vehicles. 1901. 10% of the taxi fleet was electric cars. During this period, real quick, uh, there was a fellow who invented a uh, parking meter all around uh, 08, I think, 07. And uh, it was interesting. It was a parking meter that was also a charging station. You put your money in, plugged your car in, went about your business. Uh, the primary issue, electric vehicles have generally always been practical for urban use. It's long distance where there was trouble. But surprisingly, people were to still, even in these early days, attempting to drive long distance in electric vehicles. Uh, in 1908, uh, Oliver Fritchell drove from Lincoln, Nebraska to New York City in an electric vehicle. It took him 20 days. He had one flat and charged at electric uh, central stations or garages at night. And one more for you, fill that head with useless knowledge. The first cars designed and produced by Ferdinand Porsche were electric cars. And I joke about this, and I shouldn't, but I don't know how slow Mr. Bliss was, but he had the distinction of becoming the first pedestrian in the United States struck and killed by an automobile. And he was struck and killed by an electric taxi cab. By 1901... There were more than 50 automobile companies in the United States, and there was electric, steam, and gasoline. The, the, the bottom line is uh, nobody really knew which was going to be the most practical. And 
The electric automobile, the primary issues were batteries and charging. And I'll get to that in a minute. Steam cars, you know, by, by 1912, uh, let's just say, that make that a good milestone, that was the year that the electric starter was introduced on the Cadillac. And that was a game changer. Uh, with that one development, all of a sudden gasoline automobile vehicles became much more practical and steam and electric cars fell by the wayside. That doesn't mean some people refused to give up. One was Mr. Abner Doble. His steam car is just absolutely astounding. One of the uh, primary issues with a steam car is it takes 30 minutes or more to build a head of steam and they're kind of complicated. He invented electric ignition flash boiler, and you could have a head of steam in three minutes. And uh, 1,700 miles, 1,500 miles on a 17-gallon tank of water, uh, about 20 miles to a gallon on kerosene for the burner. Detroit Electric was one of the most successful of the electric automobile manufacturers. They survived well up into the 1930s, and... Uh, a lot of, the, of course, for obvious reasons, this wasn't promoted or talked about a lot. But uh, electric vehicles. Detroit Electric was one of the most successful. Oops, we had a technical thing there. Um, it, uh, the wives of Henry Ford and Walter Chrysler, they drove uh, electric vehicles. And they produced a small fleet of delivery trucks for testing by the United States Postal Service in the 1930s. And, of course, hybrids. Oh, here's another one for you. Nothing new there. We have... Uh, uh, Woods is a company they started in uh, 1899... Uh, again, fill your head with a little useless knowledge. The first car imported into Hawaii, an electric vehicle. Uh, they began building all kinds of electric cabs, uh, but their most innovative was the Woods Dual Power. It had a four-cylinder gasoline engine with dual generators, auxiliary for the electric motor. And uh, at 15 miles per hour or under, the, the gas engine idled, and it was an electric car. And then, but the gasoline engine allowed for speeds up to 35 miles per hour. The old nothing new under the sun. <clears throat> to give you an idea how dramatically things were changing, how fast, uh, take a look at this quick little, these little quick little numbers here. 1909, 828,000 horse-drawn vehicles manufactured, but a mere 125,000 automobiles. Now, you flip that around 20 years later, 4,000 horse-drawn vehicles and 4.75 million automobiles. See, but you know, we've got to think, just like today, people are resisting change and think it's going to happen. Whether we like it or not, things change. Uh, that's just the nature of things. And um, it wasn't just automobiles that were taking place, changing this, but think about all the infrastructure, livery stables, blacksmith shops, carriage makers, all these things in 20 years became antiquated. One of the great numbers here is 1920. More people have an automobile than indoor plumbing. Now, this is also why we like to blame the oil companies and all these things for the death of the electric vehicle. In part, a little bit. But the big reason was there was no place to charge electric vehicles. You have to remember, until the Tennessee Valley Authority came in in the south, harnessing the Tennessee River, uh, rural America did not have electricity. Well into the 1930s, many places didn't have electricity. I believe it was uh, 1926 before Gallup, New Mexico, had electric service. Obviously, an electric vehicle is not real practical if you don't have a place to plug it in. Alexander Winton was a pioneer. Uh, he established the Winton Bicycle Company, built a motorized vehicle, and organized the Winton Motor Carriage Company. And then he had an ill-fated trip, kind of a comedic adventure. He attempted to drive across the United States by automobile in 1901. But it was a complete lack of roads that stymied his endeavors.
And then we have uh, a, a real dramatic changing times. Not only do we go from having no roads, in 1909, we were building concrete highways. Electric traffic signals are being installed. The Cloverleaf Highway, just 15 years later, uh, Motel changed our lexicon. And in 1930, 29 years after Winton couldn't drive across the country, we were building paved highways more than 10,000 miles annually. And it all changed. We start out, of course, Alexander went to no roads. Then we go with named roads, Lincoln Highway, National Trails Road, Dixie Highway, uh, Jefferson Highway. The Association of State Highway Officials established in 1914. And then Federal Aid Highway Program initiated. Part of this earlier had been the postal roads in rural areas. And this built on the establishment of postal roads. 1917, Wisconsin became the first state to replace trail signs with numbers. Then we had the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1921, and then universal sign recommendations, and it started, <coughs> excuse me, we started developing with, with, with speed. Uh, universal sign recommendations, 1923, 1924, selection of transcontinental routes, and then, 1925, we established the uh, highway identification system. And of course, this gave rise to the U.S. highway system. Uh, U.S. 60 was one of the first uh, one of the highways connecting Chicago to Los Angeles, and uh, 1926. But um, this re resulted in a little bit of a political squabble. A compromise was reached. And U.S. 60, it was given a new number, U.S. 66, which is probably better. Get your kicks on Route 60 just doesn't have the same ring. Route 66 is not our most historic. It's not our most scenic highway. But from its inception, it's always had the best press and the best publicity. Just one example, the song Route 66, written by Bobby Troop and made famous by Nat King Cole. It's the most recorded song in history. It has been performed by just about everybody that you can remotely imagine internationally. And, of course, we, we know that, uh, pre, especially in the pre-COVID world, the, before the apocalypse, Route 66's popularity internationally was astounding. And World Monument Fund found that the Route 66 shield is recognized internationally as much, if not more so, than Coca-Cola. And things like the Route 66 navigation app, uh, is, this is a uh, tool for the modern era. This is... This, is re this replaces maps to a certain degree. The, interestingly enough, this is also the future of Route 66 in more ways than one. It shows the international nature. This product and the Mother Road Route 66 Passport were developed by Touch Media, uh, a company based out of uh, uh, Bratislava, Slovakia, managed by a passionate Route 66 uh, enthusiast and supporter, uh, Marian Pavel. Now we jump forward. Because of the, the, the recognition, the, the name recognition Route 66 has, it has become the focal point in the last 10 years for development of Route 66 as an electric highway and to show the viability of electric vehicles. Uh, electric vehicle cruise-in in Atlanta, Illinois, attracted almost 100 vehicles. Uh, articles as early as 1913 started talking about electric road trips revitalizing historic Route 66. Websites like PlugShare that made it possible uh, for people to find where to charge their vehicles along the road dramatically increased the traffic of, of electric vehicles on Route 66. Uh, PlugShare is kind of interesting. In the early years with Alexander Winton, aside from roads, one of the primary issues was, where in the world do I buy gasoline? Electric vehicles, where do you charge your vehicle? Well, plug share. 
And another great milestone in all of this was in 2014, the International Route 66 Festival was held in Kingman, Arizona. And the theme was Kingman Crossroads of the Past and the Future. But it could have been uh, Route 66 Crossroads of the Past and Future. Uh, one of the things we had was a conference, and you can still find this archived on YouTube. This became the this was the cornerstone for the Miles of Possibility conference, and uh, we had. One place, we had a representative from the Historic Electric Vehicle Foundation, and we uh, had bicycle enthusiasts, things of that nature, and. Uh, we also had people uh, talking on all aspects. Uh, Kaiser Bartuli, the National Park Service, uh, was in uh, was here, and some of the uh, people in attendance jumped on the bandwagon. Larry Klontz in Shamrock, Arizona, uh, Shamrock, Texas, met with representatives from Tesla and electric vehicle uh, people that were here at the event. And within nine months, he had electric charging stations uh, for Tesla and other vehicles at the iconic U-Drop-In in, in uh, Shamrock, Texas. Surprisingly, considering that the, at the event, the world's first electric vehicle museum was open the Powerhouse Visitor Center, surprisingly, we didn't really do anything with uh, the opportunity of charging stations until now. Uh, they just broke ground for charging stations at the powerhouse uh, almost seven years after the event. Kind of odd. I, I never understood why that happened. Uh, but we are finally starting to move it forward. We have the embryonic exhibit at the Powerhouse Visitor Center in Kingman. And the city has recently acquired this old Safeway building in the upper left. Most recently, the uh, State of Arizona Department of Economic Security building. And uh, it will be the future uh, Route 66 Electric Vehicle Museum. The popularity of Route 66 made it easy for companies to get uh, to magnify their promotional initiatives when they had an electric vehicle to introduce. Example: 2014, when Harley Davidson rolled out their electric motorcycle. Well. They tested it along Route 66 with tremendous media coverage. Uh, chairman of TV Group in London did a, in 2014, an electric vehicle drive along Route 66. Jerry Asher did plug in around Arizona in 2017, uh, showing the viability of long distance travel with electric vehicles. Rick Carl. Uh, not the ideal vehicle for doing a long-distance trip, but uh, he became the first uh, I Miev owner to drive Route 66 from start to finish and he, with an electric vehicle, uh, largely using the magic of plug share. And then we have headlines like more auto chargers coming to Route 66 in Illinois. Uh, the center picture between the Sky Chief there, that is uh, the, in uh, uh, Dwight, Illinois, Ambler, Texaco. Uh, been there since the 1930s. It's now their visitor center. And this is kind of a glimpse of the, the past, the present, and the future of Route 66. Here's a vintage gasoline station. It has all the amenities for people traveling Route 66 by bicycle. And it also has EV charging facilities. The future is now, as they used to say. Uh, recently, the Arizona Office of Tourism launched an electric vehicle travel guide that included tours on Route 66, statewide maps, uh, emergency contact information. And it's, it's still, there's still certain challenges. Uh, Tesla has really pushed the envelope for long-distance travel by EV. Uh, Mike and Jessica May uh, have really proven the viability of this. They uh, are real uh, proponents, almost evangelists for electric vehicles. They have recently attended the Neon Fest 
in Arcadia, Oklahoma, uh, from their home in Las Vegas, driving their Tesla down Route 66, and they're uh, uh, really instrumental in creation of the Route 66 Electric Car Club, which uh, currently has uh, just over, this is a little bit uh, outdated picture, they have well over 500 members at this time. And uh, we are seeing all along Route 66 now uh, electric vehicles. Tesla, of course, is the most common. You can uh, there's enough charging stations now. The desert, uh, there's a little desert anxiety, but just as there used to be with people with gasoline uh, in the in the uh, uh, Mojave Desert section of the road. But the rest of Route 66 from LA to Chicago. Uh, People are doing it all the time with their Teslas. Uh, most recently, last year, National Geographic uh, tested several electric vehicles to learn about green energy, long-distance travel, and what highway did they select to do this with? Why, Route 66, of course. Made for some interesting reading. They tested the uh, Hyundai Kona Tesla Model S were the primary vehicles that they were testing on this. And uh, they had a lot of interesting things to say. It's well worth a read. Uh, recently, October 29th, 2021, uh, best EV route to travel across the United States. Imagine this, Route 66. Kind of, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's kind of ironic when you think about it uh, that we've gone this way. And I should note that we've also gone full circle. Uh, this whole thing started with bicycles, and bicycle tourism on Route 66 has become a very very major thing. Adventure Cycling Association now has produced a map series and GPS series, and uh, groups like Lon Haldeman. Uh, regularly uh, conduct tours along Route 66 bicycling. And here, here's the greatest hint of what the future has. Hertz has ordered 100,000 EVs uh, for their rental fleet. And I have already received, even though they're not planning to get to the States uh, for some of these tours until late 2022, early 2023, I had some of these tour groups that I work with have been asking me uh, how soon they, do I think that they'll be able to rent Teslas for their uh, Route 66 tours. Well, uh, looks like I'm about out. I don't want to beat my gums too much, and I sure want to get to your questions. I want to give a shout-out to Louis Keene and his crew, uh, Uranus, Missouri, you gotta see it's it's something you gotta you gotta see this place. That's all I got. I can tell you, juvenile humor runs supreme. It is just fun, and they have good food, all kinds, not just fudge, but a lot of good food, interesting things. Circus sideshow museum, and I understand that they're about ready to open Uranus number two in Anderson, Indiana, and that kind of brings this together and we'll sit down and see if I can chew the fat a bit and answer your questions and uh, see what we got here. Andy down in Tombson and Michael, I'll give you a call a call sometime this week. Mr. Keith Kentner, God bless. Good morning. Jim, I had uh, been away from the news for a bit. I am glad that you're safe and sound. It sure looks like it was a bad situation back there with all the tornadoes. And I'm glad you and your family are safe. Brian, good morning. John, that would be interesting. Most interesting. I toured, uh, when I was in Germany last time, I toured the Audi factory. And uh, they have a museum there. And they show the uh, Audi electrics that they were experimenting with back in the late 60s and 70s. Andy, that's it. Uh, prairie dogs and uh, black-footed ferrets. And occasionally, 
Pronghorn Antelope. Good morning, Lee. Brian, my pleasure. You know, I'm afraid that joke is an old one, but I'm afraid it's uh, pretty much an outdated one anymore. It's getting there. Hell, oh, Angela's with us. Good morning, Angela. We definitely need to talk and get caught up. Uh, I'm sure curious about what you've got going there in McLean. Angela is putting together the uh, Cactus Inn Motel in McLean, Texas on Route 66. It's a uh, uh, mid-50s, I think 1956 motel, Jim. And uh, the uh, Red River Steakhouse is just down the street, a spit and a jump. Uh, makes for a great, great overnight stop, great pit stop. McLean's got a lot of interesting things, by the way, if you get a, get a chance to stop there. Check out the uh, Devil's Rope, the Barbed Wire Museum. Perhaps the most amazing thing about that is it is interesting. And uh, ask for directions out to the old POW camp. A lot of neat stuff out there, too. Harley, good morning. How are you doing today? Well, uh, my friends, do we have any questions or anything? I want to bring up to speed real quick. Uh, the audio podcast, 5.30 in the morning, Mount Standard Time. It's an audio podcast. Uh, you can find links here on Jim Hinckley's America. It is uh, short, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, right now, it, I, I think I'm getting it down pretty well. I've only had a few guests, but I try to keep it... Uh, Cactus Rose? Oh, you've piqued my interest. Uh, I should mention that the, uh, the Cactus Inn RV Park uh, Motel also has a beautiful RV park. Um, but the podcast, I'm looking for guests. I don't think people want to just hear me beat my gums, but I provide updates. I share interesting history, things to get your day going. Uh, nobody gathers, I don't think, around the water cooler much anymore, but uh, things that you can uh, talk over with friends, start some conversation, fill your head with useless knowledge, you know, those kind of things. Uh, it's a uh, lot of fun. I'm looking for some guests. So if anybody has an event to promote, uh, a business that they're working on, something they're updating, um, you got a new book, author, artist, uh, you're a community organizer, give me a holler. Let's give you 15 minutes in the spotlight, see if we can get you some attention. And that's 5.30 in the morning, Mountain Standard Time. But you can always listen to it later. It's uh, archived there on the Podbean page for Jim Hinckley's America. And uh, eh, a little something I'm trying to do. I just don't have enough sense. And uh, uh, a little bit of a teaser for you. I still am holding out for a Model A Ford sedan. I'm going to, or Model A Ford. I'd like a pickup truck, preferably. But I might end up with a sedan now. I've been looking for a while to try to find a good vehicle. Uh, a Jim Hinckley's America vehicle. Uh, something that can be recognizable, brand recognition. And uh, uh, also it's going to be an advertisement for Route 66, the Centennial. And a, a promotional, a traveling billboard for my sponsors, for Jim Hinckley's America, for Route 66. Well, for better or for worse, I took the plunge and I, I bought a vehicle yesterday. I can't give you many more details quite yet. Uh, but I think it's going to get real interesting real soon. And yesterday I finished the final edit on book number 21, uh, which will be out in June of 2022. It is a book about short little detours. Uh, places like Wallapai Mountain Park, just 15 miles off Route 66, or Palo Duro Canyon. Yeah, uh, I agree with you, Brian, and a lot of places are doing this. Uh, here in the Southwest California apartment complexes that have electric vehicles, they're using their uh, cover. They're putting up parking lot covers uh, like canopies that are solar panels for electric charging stations. And uh, 
we're going for a lot of this. And it, it's really interesting with all the solar technology and off the grid, I think it would be possible, and if I may just jump out there, uh, places even like Glen Rio could, uh, you could put in, fix up something there like the old Longhorn, and tastefully, you could make it a 1950s place, extensive use of solar, or and you could uh, convert, set up the old gas pumps that are converted to electric vehicle charging stations. I've seen that a lot. Uh, Angela, you know, I do not know. Uh, I definitely plan on being the road uh, heading for the Miles of Possibilities conference, but that's in October next year. Uh, my spring has gotten really tight. I'll be in uh, Needles, California on February 12th at the Route 66 Byways event. And uh, I have a pretty busy schedule of uh, community education programs through... Uh, uh, February, January, February, and March. And I'm working diligently trying to get the first 40 points of interest done for the Kingman Main Street Historic District uh, walking tour. Uh, and then uh, National Road Trip Day kicks off the third weekend in May. And uh, they're going to have a big celebration here in Kingman. I won't give away a lot of details, but uh, I think this is going to be a major event. So when I'm hitting the road... The, the soonest will be May. I, I so miss being on the road. I, I Last year was the least amount of travel I have done since 1959. And at least in the last 20 years, uh, we've made one trip, often two, on Route 66 from end to end. And now we're two years in and we, we have not been on the road. And... Uh, Gosh, I'm anxious to do it. And it's been a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, financial, uh, we all took a pretty hard hit in the tourism industry last year. I had COVID last year, still trying to get over that. There were some family issues. My father passed last year. Uh, just a ton of issues and problems that prevented travel. But in that long-winded answer, I'm going to get on the road as soon as I can. And Angela, you can bet money I'm going to holler at you because I sure want to see personally what you're doing. And uh, anything I can do to help you there, you holler. And you did pique my interest. I'd sure like to hear more uh, about uh, the Cactus Rose. I'm really, really curious. Folks, do we have any, any other questions? Anything I can answer for you? If not, I guess what I'm going to have to do is... Uh, Bid adios, and, uh, well, we'll see you next week, same time, and hopefully tune in, and you will you can hear me uh, tomorrow. And uh, i got to tell you, the audio podcast, if you tune in, it's archived on Podbean and on Facebook, but if you tune in during the program, it's interactive. And uh, with a little bit of notice, like uh, if you want to be a guest, It'll be full audio. I'll send you the link. and You just uh, sign in, and it will be just like we're sitting in the studio talking together. My friends, thank you so very much, and uh, we'll see you soon. Vaya con Dios, mi amigos. <laughs>